Travel with us on a journey across the snow-capped Rocky Mountains of Colorado. Nothing beats the thrill of flying down a slope on a pair of skis. We'll take in the history of the Wild West. This is the land of cowboys, outlaws, and ranchers. And indulge our sense of adventure. As we meet the people who live and work along this route. I love living here. It's just a little bit of heaven. Following the banks of the mighty Colorado River. It gets you to places that many people cannot go. And the scenery is just magnificent. To the red rocks of the Utah desert. Sticking your head out the window, feeling the wind in your hair, it was just fantastic, really exhilarating. This isn't just any railway journey. This is one of the most scenic railway journeys in the world, the Rocky Mountaineer. Our journey starts in the thriving city of Denver, known as the Mile High City because, well, it's actually one mile above sea level. Our day begins in the rarefied atmosphere of the Crawford Hotel, one of the most luxurious in the state. Rather conveniently, it's part of Denver's Grand Union Station, a departure point almost as luxurious as the hotel. First constructed in 1914, it's recently been renovated and features a ticket office converted into a bar. Restaurants and 20-meter high ceilings decorated with resplendent chandeliers. We are boarding the Rocky Mountaineer, an all-inclusive luxury train with a focus on service, catering, and of course, Ordinary views. The train is pulled by two Union Pacific SD70M locomotives. Between them, these locos are capable of generating 8,000 horsepower. This will be needed to get all 12 rail cars across the 350 mile journey. After a prompt 9 a.m. departure, it's not long before we find ourselves with a drink in our hands. Traveling with us today is onboard host August, who has the tricky task of serving both refreshments and information. My goal is really to make the route come alive, right? I want to share some of the history and uh, kind of explain why this route was built, what the rail line meant to a lot of these towns. This is more than just a train journey. We'll time travel from a 21st century Denver into a truly wild west. I want to make people feel like they're they're part of the scenery, a part of the part of the journey. Departing Denver swiftly, we'll make our way up the eastern slope of the Rocky Mountains and through old mining ghost towns. We'll wind our way up through rock-hewn tunnels before crossing the snowy peaks of the Continental Divide. Next, we'll slope our way down the western side of the mountain toward our first and only stop of Glenwood Springs, a town steeped in the history of the American West. The following day, we'll pass through the lush vineyards of Palisade, home to wild mustangs. Finally, our journey ends in the desert town of Moab in Utah, a haven for adventure seekers. So ladies and gentlemen, take a look to your left, take a look to your right, say hello to your neighbors, raise a glass, and let's cheers to the adventure! Leaving the western edge of the city of Denver, we enter the wilds almost immediately. We're passing round the Big Ten Curve at the eastern base of the Rocky Mountains. The Big Ten is the first of many curves in the route, 
required to get us nearly 10,000 feet up and across the vast Rocky Mountain Range. Known in engineering terms as a horseshoe curve, the bends in the rail are designed to reduce the gradient of the climb. This allows the train's wheels sufficient traction to get it up steeper sections of the track. Trains can really only climb at a comfortable 1 to 2% grade, so they extended out the tracks, which lowered the grade of elevation, which makes it easier to climb up into the Rockies. But this is sort of our uh, landmark uh, between the high plains of Colorado uh, and the Rocky Mountains. As we climb our way up the Rocky Mountains, we take in the view whilst enjoying the first of many meals. We have our farmer's plate, which is eggs, bacon, and biscuits with a sausage gravy. And then we have a golden sugar waffle with bacon and blueberries. And our special maple syrup. After a hearty breakfast, we watch as the plains of Denver disappear replaced by the spruce, pine, and aspen trees of the Colorado Rockies. Curving our way up along the eastern incline of the mountain, we are following the route of some of Colorado's earliest pioneers. The discovery of gold in the Rocky Mountains west of Denver in 1858 caused a rush of immigration to the area. It was during this time that the city of Denver was first founded. But it was the construction of the railway through the Rocky Mountains that allowed for the mass transportation of supplies and people that helped build the Denver of today. As the railroad started to come into Denver uh, through the late 1800s, Denver started to build into the great metropolis that we know Denver is today. Today, Colorado's operational gold mines are all but gone. However, some, like owner of the High D gold mine, Chris Stone, keep the history of Colorado's gold mines alive. I'm a fourth generation Colorado gold miner and I own and operate the Heidi Gold Mine. The Heidi Gold Mine it did produce other metals, iron, silver, copper, and zinc were all subsidiary metals to it. The primary, it was gold, and it came late in the game, 1896. It was this product of more and more people getting here post-railroad uh, as these areas built in. Although the Heidi isn't an operational gold mine anymore, Chris continues to maintain the old mine shaft, dug 330 feet beneath the mountainside. Well, here we are looking at one of the gold-bearing veins. Uh, this is gold ore. The gold-bearing zone was right here. This is the pay streak, auriferous calcopyrite pay streak, which is just the Latin term for a gold-bearing copper iron sulfate vein. What you're trying to do is find the spots where Mother Nature's already helped you. You got a little crack. You could then exploit. You have unoxidized gold ore. It'll never shine like that again. From 98 million years ago when it was put here until now, it's never seen the light of day. And it'll slowly rust from here. But that's what they were looking for. It's far from pure, but the gold-bearing pyrite does contain trace amounts of the real thing. Just like the generations who came before him, Chris knows how to use the traditional method of panning to search for the elusive yellow metal. Panning for signs of gold in creeks and streams, called prospecting, was the first step in locating a large deposit of gold ore buried beneath the mountain top. The idea is gold's heavy, and if you've got it bouncing around in this little tray here, it's just not going to bounce as high as the uh, lighter rocks. So you're shaking it around, and it's starting to stratify, the heaviest going to the bottom, 
lighter to the top, and it's also knocking the gold particles free and loose. So this is pretty crucial and important step. The process seems simple enough, but there's a knack to panning that Chris has mastered just as his forefathers did before him. Step two is pretty simple. You know, tilt the pan, and this does something really important. It creates a V. And now the heavy steps in this V, I think about it like ocean waves. You got a wave going in the pan, a wave going out. Now this first wave that goes in the pan is knocking heavy stuff down the hill. The second one is gonna take the light stuff and push it out. And then I'm just gonna spin and knock these lighter ones off. And you start to see these metals come out. Basically, it's a, a fool's gold with real gold in it. And the real gold, in fact, there's even a little bit of it there. It really is that small. It's a flower gold. It's just like dust. You'd, there, that's a little bit of free gold surrounded by gold-bearing pyrite. It's not the mother load, but it is proof that there is still gold in them thar hills. And if it weren't for the railroad, local gold mines like the Heidi might never have been established. Because of the railroad, there was a lot more material, a lot more people, and it really did make the gold mining easier. Leaving the Heidi gold mine behind, we're back on the train and heading ever further up into the Rockies. Soon, we'll be confronted by the formidable James Peak, where the line will enter a marvel of 20th century American engineering. The Moffat Tunnel really is a cathedral to the engineer. And atop the mountain, we'll find ourselves in a skier's paradise. Beautiful, isn't it? We're traveling 354 miles through Colorado and Utah aboard the luxury Rocky Mountaineer on a route taking us into America's Wild West. The route we are on today is exciting because it showcases a lot of things you can't see in Colorado from the highway or from the road. We're winding our way up the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. And as ever with the Rocky Mountaineer, there's no time like the present for a light snack. In order to navigate the Rocky Mountain range, the train must pass through no fewer than 28 tunnels carved right into the mountainside. Many of these were dug by hand with pick and shovel. Luckily, it doesn't take long for us to bump into a train enthusiast who is only too happy to share their knowledge with us. Trains has been a fascination of mine for a lifetime, and the Rocky Mountaineer has uh, appealed to me for quite a while. It was incredibly difficult to cut through the Rocky Mountains, and when you think about the time frame in which it was done, uh, I think it was basically early 1900s. They did it with tools that we can't even envision today. Manpower was key. We are approaching the eastern face of the James Peak Mountain. At over 13,000 feet in height, this formidable geographic obstacle was once traversed by a train line which went up and over the mountain. Called the Rollins Pass, in wintertime, the treacherous route could leave passengers stranded in snowdrifts for weeks or even months at a time. There are newspaper articles that talk about uh, delays on Rollins Pass, uh, sometimes a few days, sometimes up to 60 days. And if you can just imagine what that would be like uh, to have two months of your life just stuck on a train. Saving us from two months stuck on the frozen mountainside is the Moffat Tunnel. At 6.2 miles long, it is the longest tunnel on our route. And at just over 9,000 feet up, it represents the highest point on our journey. The tunnel was dug almost entirely by hand. The grueling work took nearly five years to complete, with men working around the clock in often frozen conditions. 
One man who has willingly spent weeks at both Rollins Pass and the Moffat Tunnel is local historian Travis Bright. This is the East Portal of the Moffat Tunnel. This is the old company town of East Portal. But there were 300 people who lived pure. They were boring through the heart of James Peak, which is this mountain right up here. They were constructing the Moffat Tunnel from 1923 all the way through when it opened in 1928. A hundred years later, and the elements haven't claimed the old mining town yet. Mother Nature really exacts her toll here as winds just shriek off of James Peak and come rushing towards this small town. The cold is something we deal with all the time in Colorado. We're pretty used to it, but the winds uh, are what really makes life rough. And I'm sure winds would push through boards and, and through cracks in windows and just uh, howl. The tunnel was the vision of 19th century Colorado industrialist David Moffat. His ambition was to have a successful railroad company. His dream, his idea was to have a tunnel uh, bored through the center of uh, James Peak. Many of the workers who built the tunnel came from Denver. And efforts were made to ensure that they could live as comfortably as possible. You have a town that has a 24-hour mess hall serving high-quality food. There's women's bridge clubs, post office, school, so many other modern amenities because the idea was to contain everyone in this company town so that they didn't long for what was back home in Denver. This was their home for five years while the construction of the Moffat Tunnel was being undertaken. But the construction of the tunnel didn't come without a considerable cost to the people who built it. The crew sacrificed, uh, in some cases, their lives building the Moffat Tunnel. Uh, at least 28 men uh, lost their lives. Thanks to the people who built the tunnel, Denver now had a viable connection to the Western United States. The Moffat Tunnel is obviously a much more efficient route. It's obviously a straight shot through the heart of James Peak, and it takes 12 to 15 minutes. This tunnel changed American history. This was a uniquely American achievement to have the idea to uh, bore through the shoulder of James Peak and uh, send rail traffic ultimately to the Pacific Ocean, which is what David Moffat's dream was. Freight trains are given priority, so with the track now clear ahead, we get to experience this triumph of 20th century engineering. As we pass through the Moffat Tunnel, we cross what is known as the Continental Divide, the mountain ridge which runs north to south through the American continent. Water flowing from these mountains is fundamental to the supply for the whole of the United States. The Continental Divide is what splits the rainwater east and west across the United States. Starting up in Alaska, goes all the way down a continuous line uh, down to Argentina. Above our heads is Berthoud Pass, one of the peaks that make up the Continental Divide. It's a popular spot for adventure sports, including backcountry skiing. So Continental Divide is pretty neat because uh, Basically, if you were to pour your water out your water bottle over there, it's going to end up down the Atlantic. And if you pour it over there, it's going to end up in the Pacific. It's kind of a thought. I mean, we provide all the water for most of the US right here. Colorado is known for having some of the best skiing in the world due to its high altitude, good snow, and long seasons of bright, clear sunshine. Will moved to the US from Wales over 20 years ago. Now, for Will, his son Kai, and their dog Baggins, the Continental Divide is their back garden. Oh, that is good snow. It's great to be out in nature. It's great to be out with the dog and my father. Um, it's a great, 
escape from everything else, and nothing beats the thrill of flying down a slope on a pair of skis. As much as anything else, the views from the top of the Continental Divide are extraordinary. Beautiful, isn't it? That view is opening up nicely, isn't it? That's just great. Two thousand feet below, we're back on the train. Here, our train plunges into the majestic Gore Canyon. The canyon is three miles long, flanked either side by cliffs reaching up to 1,000 feet in height. The Native Americans who inhabited the area refer to it as Naonkara, meaning where blue water meets the sky. After leaving Gore Canyon, the topography of the landscape begins to flatten. This is the Western Slope, the area of Colorado west of the Rocky Mountain Range. The color of the rock begins to change too. Colorado gets its name from the Spanish translation of colored red, and it's from here that we can start to see why. Today I was constantly reminded about why this is colorful Colorado. The constantly changing scenery and the rock colors going from red to green to white to gold to peach and then just being along a body of water, mostly the Colorado River, is phenomenal. Next, we'll be approaching our overnight stop of Glenwood Springs, a town steeped in the history of the Wild West. This is the land of cowboys, outlaws, and ranchers. We're now over a hundred miles into our epic journey through the U.S. states of Colorado and Utah, traveling aboard the Rocky Mountaineer. Having passed through Gore Canyon, the mighty Colorado River will be our companion for the remainder of the journey. More than 60 miles away, our train will stop for the night at the historic spa town of Glenwood Springs. The next morning, we'll pass through the verdant valley of Palisade, where wild horses roam the countryside, before passing the state border into Utah, over the high desert, and descending through vibrant red rock canyons to our final destination of Moab. We are passing through an area known as Colorado's Western Slope. The landscape is as ancient as it is beautiful. There is evidence of hunting and habitation on this land from as far back as 12,000 BCE. Much of this is country that is nearly impossible to access by road, the train offering the only opportunity to marvel at the splendor of the landscape. It really is something special. It's just, there's nothing else like this in, in the world. I believe this is the only way to, to see the scenery. There are a few places along the route that we are the only people that get to see that scenery. Oh, the views are spectacular, and they're quite different. You go through these incredible high cliffs and the beautiful streams flowing below, the eagles soaring in the sky. And complementing the scenery is a near constant supply of food and drink. The food is endless, and there's usually a, a sweet and a savoury option, and um, or sometimes both at the same time, actually. <laughs> of course, um, you know, a little bit of wine to go with it, or gin and tonic, um, head down to the, the club car and, and sit there and have a few cocktails. Never missing an opportunity for decadence, the Rocky Mountaineer contains a dedicated lounge carriage complete with cocktail bar. With a cocktail in hand, we watch as the scenery around us starts to change. 
the geology morphing into the deep red and gold sandstone of the Western Slope. Our next stop will be Glenwood Springs. Glenwood Springs has been attracting visitors for centuries for its hot sulphur baths, warmed by geothermal heat from beneath the surface of the earth. The famous spa town was also once home to one of the most feared gunslingers of the Wild West. Glenwood Springs is the hometown of uh, the famous outlaw and uh, gambler Doc Holliday. He's actually buried just above the town. It's a, a neat little hike. Taking August's advice, we head off on a neat little hike in the company of Bill Kite, the director of the local museum. Doc Holliday was tough. You had to be to live in the Wild West of those days, which included here in Glenwood Springs. A dentist, card player, and gunfighter with a formidable reputation, Doc Holliday is an icon of the old American West. After contracting tuberculosis aged 21, Holliday made his way to Glenwood Springs, hoping the region's climate and famous hot springs would ease his symptoms. When he first came west, he developed ability to play cards. And as a result, that's how he made his living because he couldn't be a dentist with tuberculosis. But it was his skill with a pistol at the legendary gunfight at the OK Corral in 1881 in Arizona that gained Holiday his reputation. He became famous at the OK Corral as uh, he was deputized along with Wyatt Earp and his brothers to stop the cowboys and that resulted in the, one of the last major famous gunfights of the West. He came here in Glenwood Springs the last six months of his life in the last stages of tuberculosis. He died and was buried here somewhere in the cemetery. Glenwood Springs keeps alive the memory of Doc Holliday with this memorial. And people like to come here and leave offerings. Sometimes it's money, sometimes it's a teddy bear, or a lot of times it's whiskey. Doc Holliday's death coincided with what many consider to be the end of the Wild West. For Glenwood Springs, this would be the start of a new era as the railway rode into town. Glenwood Springs would not be what it is without the railroad. The Denver and Rio Grande Railroad came into Glenwood for the first time October 4th, 1887, less than a month before Doc Holliday died laying in his bed. After a long day in the saddle, it's time to get some rest at the Hotel Denver. Thankfully, we only need to mosey on a few steps from the station to get there. The next morning, we'll continue our journey into America's Wild West. Bright and early the following morning, and we're climbing back aboard the luxury Rocky Mountaineer for a prompt 7 a.m. departure. All aboard! We're embarking on the final part of our journey into the state of Utah. Over 30 miles from Glenwood Springs, we'll pass through the lush vineyards of Palisade, where wild mustangs roam in the surrounding valleys. Crossing over the state border into Utah, we'll experience the vast expanse of the high desert before dropping down into the deep red rock canyons of our final destination, Moab. Aboard the train, breakfast is quickly underway. I will. Yeah, and, uh, more tomato juice? Yeah, yeah. There you are. One of the main things that I love about the Rocky Mountaineers is that if you're getting off the train hungry, we've done something terribly wrong. Taking personal responsibility for everyone's appetite is train manager, Zach. So breakfast is uh, a front range platter with the flavors of the plains. And then you have the Colorado Strata, which is a custom dish made by our chef. And they even set the pastry to look like little mountains with a little raspberry coulis on top. Absolutely beautiful and totally delicious. 
Accompanying our decadent breakfast are views of a landscape that seem straight out of an old western movie. Approaching the border with Utah, the deep red and yellow sandstone emblematic of the state becomes more vivid. I love how the landscape travels from an alpine environment. So you go into Glenwood Springs and literally as you leave the station, the, it starts to transition into those beautiful crimson red rocks. The majestic Colorado River remains our companion as we hug its banks through yawning canyons and grand ravines. The Rocky Mountaineer cruises through a vibrant green valley. This is Palisade. Here, nutrient-rich soil and a climate combine to create the perfect conditions for growing grapes for winemaking. Just north of Palisade is a wildlife refuge like no other. The Little Book Cliffs comprises over 35,000 acres of land. The vast range is populated by rare wildlife, including that icon of the American frontier, wild Mustang horses. Responsible for observing and caring for these horses is local ranger and Friends of the Mustangs volunteer, Judy Cady. So we're right here, and this is the Little Bookless Wild Horse area. As Friends of the Mustangs, we check the horses, count the babies, make sure the horses are doing well. Well, I got involved, I was probably in my late 20s, I started riding a Mustang. And wow, and out here exploring in all this country, and it was great, I loved it. It just became an obsession for me. Oh, I see some wild ones. Wild horses, yeehaw! Today, there are around 150 horses spread out over the Little Book Cliffs Refuge. Yeah, seeing these horses is reassuring. As long as you got food and water and places for them to roam, they'll do real well. So the Mustangs, they can just go anywhere. You know, they, they were born here. They're, they're raised at an early age just climbing these mountains, so they can just do amazing things because they're born doing it. Sometimes the Mustang population on the range becomes too large and horses are offered up for adoption to carefully selected owners. It's not always easy finding people willing to train wild Mustangs. However, some like Palisade Mustang trainer Paige Burnham, are up to the challenge. I grew up here in western Colorado. I've been doing this for about three years. Um, I've started 14 Mustangs from the wild and brought them to understand how to be domestic horses. I grew up with horses. I was born on Christmas Eve and on a horse on Christmas Day, so. I've been around horses my whole life and definitely always loved them. Paige cares for horses at various stages of the training process. However, she still maintains a particular affection for the first Mustang she adopted, Zayana. I don't really know why I got Zayana, my first Mustang. And so I decided to go to the adoption and see if any horses caught my eye. And I fell in love with the little yearling filly that was backing up to the fence and trying to kick everybody. Um, so I brought her home and trained her and she is probably one of the best horses I will ever own. It's taken a lot of training, but in just a few years, Zayana has gone from wild Mustang to a potential future Olympian. She is currently, she is in competition at first level dressage. She's shown a lot of talent and I actually had a clinic a couple weeks ago with an, an Olympic 
level rider who was very impressed with her and said that she thought with the proper training she could make it all the way to the top levels. So she's a very talented little horse. The special thing about Mustangs is that they were selectively bred in the wild to live in nature, live in the desert. And the bond that we build with them when we're able to bring them out of the wild and build a relationship with them is super strong and special. We're back on the train and about to enter the final stretch of our journey. We'll visit a remote old railway town in the middle of the desert. I love living here, it's just a little bit of heaven. And commune with nature on a trip down the Colorado River. You tap out of your life and tap into river life. We're entering the final stage of our grand two-day journey aboard the luxurious Rocky Mountaineer. We're about to pass over the border between Colorado and Utah. And welcome to Utah. Here we enter an area of land known as the High Desert. Over 70 million years ago, this area would have been the bed of a shallow sea which separated the North American continent. Today, there's not a drop of water in sight, but the desert has a beauty all of its own. I can't believe how much variety in terrain we've had in just two days. Sticking your head out the window, feeling the wind in your hair, it was just fantastic, really exhilarating. As we fly through this vast expanse, we pass a town that's clinging to life. Welcome to Cisco, population four. Local resident Jean is only too happy to show us around. There was over 200 people lived out here at one time. It had a pharmacy, a schoolhouse for the kids. It had two hotels. It was a booming town. Cisco used to be a water refilling station for the steam trains that once came through this town. Today, it's still covered with little pieces of railroad history. So they would pump the water from the Colorado River, and so the town would get the water, and the trains would get the water. And this is part of the pump that would pump that water up from the river. So a lot of these buildings are either on railroad ties or made out of railroad ties, which I'm sure is a testament why it's still standing. With the demise of the steam train, the town fell into decline. Cisco may not be what it used to be, but Jean can think of nowhere else she'd rather live. I love living here. It's quiet. It is a bit remote, but we love it. The stars at night are unbelievable out here. We love it living out here. It's just a little bit of heaven. Train tracks are literally just right across the road there. But the train goes, still goes through here every day, a couple of times. So, and so does the mountaineer. We're leaving the plains of the high desert behind us and heading south along the Colorado River and through the deep red rock canyons of Utah. The scenery is breathtaking. We'll soon be approaching our final stop of Moab. But before we do, the banks of the Colorado River offer a great opportunity to embrace our adventurous side. We're gonna put in at a place called Onion Creek, which is actually, we're gonna show you our favorite route on the river today. The mountains and canyons around Moab are a popular spot for thrill-seekers of all stripes. In the valley, the Colorado River is a prime location for rafting. And tour operator Catherine is only too keen to take us out on one of her voyages. Bye, kids. Well, the Colorado River is my home river. It's where I learned to raft. My first rafting trip ever 
was on the Colorado River and it changed my life. But it's a fascinating river and it, it really is so iconic because it figures so strongly in the history of the American West. So much wildlife, so many living beings, plants and animals thrive along here. It's a 1500 mile river, starts up in the mountains in the state of Colorado. For Catherine, rafting on the Colorado River is an almost spiritual experience. I think it's about 75% of the people on this planet or more live near water. It's the stuff of life. We relate to it in ways that we can't even understand, um, but it, it makes us feel at home. You know, they say there's no time like river time, and being on a river, you're so present. You're just, it just really, it really feel, fills the soul. Today, Catherine shares her love of rafting the Colorado with budding thrill seekers. You know, people come here on vacation and they don't necessarily want to talk about back home. They want to soak this place up. And we pull them to a place where they, they can't have self-service. It's this whole other world. There's all these interesting ecosystems and this stunning, endless scenery. And they can't help but be enveloped by it. You tap out of your life and tap into river life. Despite the blustery weather, nothing can dampen Catherine's enthusiasm for river life. A rapid's coming up. It's very rocky, it's wonderful. Drying off back on the train, we are entering the very last stretch of our epic journey and the views are spectacular. Utah is famed for its huge red rock mesas, flat-topped hills or mountains shaped by millions of years of erosion. The landscape gets its deep red color from the oxidized iron in the rock that is abundant in this part of the state. As the train pulls into its final stop on the outskirts of Moab, a local welcoming party comes to greet us. Having arrived in the true heart of the Wild West, it's time for us passengers to hang up our spurs and go our separate ways. With the Rocky Mountaineer parked in a desert siding. It's time to reflect on our epic two-day journey through Colorado and Utah. We have climbed into the snow-covered peaks of the Rocky Mountains, followed the banks of the mighty Colorado River through majestic canyons, marveled at lush green valleys and felt the wind in our hair through desert vistas, traveling through an ever-changing landscape from the plains of Denver to the Red Rock Mountains of Utah. 